Here we are, chapter 9. We'll be looking at Proverbs chapter 9 today. I chose to simply entitle this particular portion of our study through the book of Proverbs, Forsake Foolishness and Live. You'll see that as we look at this uh, portion of Scripture, Forsake Foolishness and Live. So let's begin reading together here in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places in the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, come, eat of my bread. Drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live and go in the way of understanding. Now, as we're looking at this, we have seen that wisdom has been personified. And we have seen that wisdom is being presented to us, especially in chapter 8 and now in chapter 9. Wisdom has been presented to us as being at work. We see in chapter 8, verses 27 and 28, how he had written... Uh, when he prepared the heavens, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, and he goes on. What he was saying there is wisdom was revealed in the work of creation, the creation of the universe, as well as the earth. And so as we enter into chapter 9, uh, wisdom is revealed at work still, but this time wisdom is being revealed as being at work amongst men. Notice how he says in verse 1, wisdom has built her house. So what we have here, and I have to develop this with you because you're going to see a contrast in a few verses. So let me uh, lay a foundation for us as, as we look at this. Wisdom in verse 1 is, is depicted as building her house. She's being presented as a Middle Eastern queen. That's the picture you have here when it speaks of wisdom building her house. She's being presented as, as royalty. It's a picture of her and her attendants. And it says that wisdom has built her house. This house, in Scripture sometimes, a house is used to refer to the inhabited world. And so what you're seeing is wisdom in, uh, at work amongst the inhabited world. Um, Job 38, verses 4 through 6 uh, says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? To, to what were its foundations fastened? Who laid its cornerstone? That's a picture of construction there. The house is very often used to speak of the inhabited world. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, the writer said, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. And in chapter 3 of Hebrews, verse 4, every house is built by someone. He who built all things is God. And so what you have here is you have wisdom's work in the world and wisdom's work, especially amongst men. And so it speaks in that way. In verse uh, 1 again, it speaks of her hewing out seven pillars. So when it says she has hewn out her seven pillars, you need to remember that there is something called um, numerics, biblical numerics. Um, sometimes people may say, Biblical numerology, that's not the proper word. Numerology speaks of an occult practice. The word numeric speaks of numbers and how the word, how, the, how a number is used in Scripture. And when you go through Scripture very often, not always, but very often, the number seven is used to speak of perfection or completion. The number seven is used in that way. I'll give you one example. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And so seven is the number of completeness or perfection. So she has hewn out seven pillars. And so this is speaking of the completeness of wisdom. And it speaks of this house that she's building. Notice with me that the house is large enough to hold a banquet, a banquet for any who desire to attend that they might have wisdom. It goes on to say in verse two, she slaughtered her meat mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. 
sent out her maidens, cries out from the highest places of the city, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, come eat of my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed, forsake foolishness and live, go in the way of understanding. So she has slaughtered her meat, he says. She's mixed her wine. Wisdom has prepared a feast. It's a feast for all who desire to be at her table. It's a picture of something that is generous as well as delicious. And it also is a picture of something that is desirable. So that's the picture you have here. It's a banquet. It's, it's something that, that a, a hungry person would really find uh, inviting. And that's the picture that we have here. Notice in verses 3 and 4 how it says that she sent out her, her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. In verse 4, it speaks of her issuing an invitation. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. So the table is ready. Guests are invited. But here's the thing. To enter and to partake requires desire and humility. The call is for anyone, and the call is open. This is a public invitation. What's interesting, it's a public invitation for the naive as well as the shallow. So in order to receive wisdom, you actually have to have humility because you have to realize that we have to realize that we are naive and we are shallow. Because if we don't, we'll never have wisdom. That's, that's something that almost seems contradictory. In order to gain wisdom, I have to say I'm shallow? But the answer is yes. Uh, I was in church one time, and I was going to say that's like a paradox. And the minister, pastor, was giving a Bible study, and my sister Madeline was seated next to me, and he said, and this is one of those, it's a paradox. He went like that. My sister was seated next to me, and she, said, and she writes a little note. Some of you never do that here, I know. We've never found them on the floor, ever. Um, when's he going to stop? No, we've seen that. <laughs> but in the, uh, it, there, my sister wrote a, a little note to me. He, the, the, the pastor had just said, and it's a paradox. So she writes, what's a paradox? She, so I wrote, handed it to her, and she opened it up, and I wrote, Two doctors. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh in church at the wrong time. <laughs> but she, 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 she could hardly contain herself. I never forget that. I still to this day will tease her. I'll say, that's a paradox. And she remembers that we were in church. But it's one of those things that if you want to have wisdom, the way into wisdom is to understand that you don't have it. The way to, to have something like that is to admit that I don't possess it. So that requires humility. I have to admit that I'm simple. I have to admit that I lack understanding. Now, over the centuries, uh, this portion has been interpreted to apply to the church. You see the house, for example, referring to the church of the living God, even as Paul speaks of the church in that way. You see the seven pillars, and, and uh, Christian theologians have pointed out that the seven pillars would speak of the foundation of eternal truth. You see that the, uh, the meat has been slaughtered. That shows us wisdom has made provision for the guests. And so we, we would recognize that as being the sacrifice of Jesus. You have the mingled wine. This would speak of the sweetness and purity of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is referred to as new wine. It speaks of sending out her maidens, and that would refer to the mission of the church to reach the lost. It also says that she cries out from the highest places. Crying out, once again, speaks of an open invitation. And here's what she says, verse 5. Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed, and then forsake foolishness and live. Go in the way of understanding. Come, eat of my bread, drink of my wine. Well, you would understand, obviously, bread and wine 
what would that represent in the New Testament? The body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so there's a picture here um, giving to us an invitation to salvation. And it's saying that you need to partake fully of this in order that you might have divine life within you. It reminds me of, of a teaching that Jesus gave in the city of Capernaum. When you read your Bible, your New Testament, you're going to see that the city of Capernaum is a city that's mentioned quite often. It's a place that became the uh, headquarters for Jesus. Jesus was born and uh, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. But at a certain point, he moved his headquarters of ministry into the port city of Capernaum. And so when you read your New Testament, very often you will see quite a number of things that occur in uh, the city of Capernaum. And one occasion uh, is found in John chapter 6. You see that the Lord Jesus Christ has just, uh, has just performed the miracle of uh, feeding a multitude with fish and loaves that he multiplied. And, and after he had done that, uh, John records how he had gone and, and the people had followed him. And they, they wanted to, to be near him because, and he says it to him, he says, you're, you're here because uh, I, I produced food for you and I fed your hunger. And now he begins to speak to them and he begins to share with them concerning what it means to have a real relationship with God through him. And at a certain point in John chapter 6, it's found in verses 52 through 56, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And so you see the invitation in the Old Testament that is fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the new. Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed. Again, remember that Paul refers to Jesus as the power and wisdom of God. So Jesus Christ would be portrayed here in Proverbs as giving that invitation to partake fully in him that we might have life. Now notice in verse 6 how it says, Forsake foolishness and live, go in the way of understanding. Foolishness. Foolishness speaks of living sinfully. Foolishness, very often, especially in the Proverbs, is speaking of the person who lives as if there is no God. When you look in the psalm, Psalm 14, verse 1, the psalmist says, The fool says in his heart, there's no God. And then he goes on to describe this fool. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. And then he goes on to say, there's none who does good. And so forsake foolishness. The invitation is for the ungodly to change their way. The invitation is for the ungodly to come to know God. Instead, instead of living as if there is no God, come to the understanding and knowledge of him. And you do so because... That is the wise thing to do. Like it says in Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Notice with me, all are invited, but not all come to eat the bread of life. Not all come to imbibe of the spirit of God, to drink the spirit of God in, if you will. Remember when we were in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10? how Paul had spoken of the Lord in this way. He said that God is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. The invitations to everybody. Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient to save every single human being who is on the face of the earth and has ever been since he was there dying on the cross and pouring out his blood. He is sufficient. He is enough for all. The Bible teaches that very clearly that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. When God allowed his son and placed his son, if you will, on that cross to die as the uh, propitiation, to die as the ransom, to be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God who gave his life for the world. When Jesus Christ took upon himself the, uh, the sin of the whole world and he became sin for us, he did so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And he took upon himself our sin. And it was the sin of the world. And yet, when the gospel goes out, 
and we proclaim to people, come to faith in Christ, receive the Lord. He'll wash you clean of your sin. Your problem isn't simply economic. Your problem isn't simply a lack of opportunity or a lack of education. Your, your problem isn't completely settled on the fact that you had a rough upbringing or you didn't have a dad, you didn't know your mom. All of those things, of course, contribute to our the misery that we live in. But that's not the root of the problem. And that's one of the things that people fail to understand. We, um, we can't be educated into happiness. And we, we can't be... We can't be given money until we're happy. Now, if you want to, if you want to give me some to see if that works or not, <laughs> it doesn't. I'll just be less unhappy. But what happens is you can't buy, and we know that. I mean, there were four prophets when I grew up called the Beatles, and one of them <laughs> sang, you can't buy me love. And, and, you know, as shallow as that music was at that time, the message is true. It's true. You can't buy me love. Love can't be bought. Love is something that is freely given to us by God. And salvation is something that we didn't purchase. It was purchased for us. And the invitation is given to us to receive by faith, to humble ourselves and say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I'm miserable. And I have a tremendous need in my life. And there's a hole in my heart that I've tried to fill with so many different things, but the only thing that will really completely fill that, that gap in me, is you. And that's what salvation is. And that's how you come to a knowledge of God, is by receiving. So the invitation is come and eat of my bread, and then the requirement is forsake foolishness. If you turn from your wicked ways, God will hear us and turn himself towards us, and we'll have a relationship with him. This invitation is given but not always responded to in faith. Hebrews 3.15 says it like this, While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. When God's Holy Spirit speaks to you and convicts you of sin, don't harden your heart. So the invitation continues to this very moment. Verse 7, He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Scoffer. We don't use that word. A scoffer, somebody defined the word scoffer as a cynical heckler. We probably don't use the word heckle either, do we? You know, somebody who's like in the crowd, you're speaking, and they just keep interrupting you, and they keep putting you down, saying things to you. You're starting to make a point, and they, they yell out, in church a few years ago now, uh, I was teaching and I had somebody get upset and he stood up and he flipped me off and yelled some words that weren't appropriate. And I told Raul, listen, if you're mad at me, <laughs> just send me an email. Right now, his ears are burning. He said, Rosalda said something about me again. I'm just playing, of course. No, this guy stood up and flipped me off, and he was swearing at me and walked out. You know, That's happened many times for people. Some of you perhaps have seen it. Sometimes I haven't even seen it. I just keep talking. I don't notice because I can't see anyway. You know, I thought he was waving. You know, I didn't, I didn't count his fingers, you know, but... But a scoffer is a cynical heckler. It's the person that when you're speaking, interrupts you, puts you down, calls you names. It's a person that is what has been called self-inflative. It's also a word that is used to describe what would be called a derisive, a derisive, um, a der a derisive bully, if you will, a scorner. 
Um, this is a person who refuses to live by God's word. This is someone who ridicules it and will ridicule anyone who shares it with him. I, I think his, his name is Bill Maher. I mean, that's what they do. He does that. He, and some of you know his name. If you don't, that's okay. Don't waste your time finding out. But all of us, if you share, if you share your faith, if you share your faith, some of you may say, I've never had somebody do that. Well, just keep sharing your faith, because eventually you do. Eventually, you'll have somebody say to you that you're stupid. You'll have somebody say, how ridiculous. I've had it many times. Um, that just happens. They, they will say things to you, and they, they try to um, make you feel stupid as you're sharing. That's a scoffer. This is the one who refuses to live by God's word. Well. He's saying the result of correcting someone like this is shame, and, and it may even result in personal harm. You may be attacked. Uh, Proverbs 15, verse 12, reads, A scoffer doesn't love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. Proverbs 29, 1 says, He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. You see... There are times when you, when you share a word of correction and the person that you're bringing a word of wisdom and correction to gets really upset and will get mad. And that's what he's saying in verse 7. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself. Because there are times that you may bring a word of correction to somebody who's not going to listen to you. Um, it, in, in, normal, in a normal course of life, this, this, may, this may be something that I should say. Um, sometimes, because I'm a pastor and I, and I speak the way that I do with, in the manner that I do, you, you may think that, that, I, that I just enter into debates and arguments easily and quickly, but the fact is I don't. The fact is I don't. And there, there are many, many times where people have been saying things to me where I'm, they don't know I'm a pastor, they don't know what I do, and they're just saying things that are rude and obnoxious, or they do something, and I don't intervene. I don't go there and say, you know what? You need to stop doing that. I, I don't do that. Uh, I don't intervene unless I sense that I, I need to, and most of the time, I don't. And I especially know that to try and correct somebody who's angrily scornful can be dangerous, that that person could could turn on you and, 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 and attack you. So you have to have wisdom. You know, I, I've mentioned how that I, I brought my father to Christ and I said to him the things that I said, you're a good man, best man I'll ever know. You'll be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Christ. That was my dad I was speaking to who, who basically, because he was my father, uh, resisted the temptation to kill me. But there are other people that I wouldn't say that to. There are other people that I'm very, I would be very careful with. So I'm, I'm letting you know, don't leave this place and say, I just got to grab people by the throat and say, you're going to hell or heaven and make your choice because that's not the wisest thing to do. And also be aware that there are times when the family may get together for a holiday like Easter, Christmas, or New Year, or whatever, birthday, and somebody's acting the fool. And that doesn't mean that you have to take them aside and correct them. You need to have wisdom in that. Because sometimes it can be downright dangerous. So have wisdom before you do something. And that's basically what he's saying. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself. He who re rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Then he goes on in verse 8. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. But he goes on to say, rebuke a wise man and he will love you. And so don't rebuke a scoffer lest he hates you but a wise man will love you for the correction. You see, the one desiring to gain wisdom will actually have a love for you for bringing a word of correction. Why is that? Well, it's because they're seeking to grow in their knowledge of the Lord. And it's because they're mature and humble enough to see that correction was needed. Proverbs 27, 6 is a beautiful scripture. We'll see it someday. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. There are times when your friend is the only one who can tell you the truth. 
and then you get all mad at them. Your friend says, you've got a bad temper, and then you get all mad at them. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I had a friend, his name is Jim, and Jim and I were talking one day, and I said to him, Jim, Jim, you, you, you're, very, you're very much without joy. You, I said, you need the Lord, Jim, and you are very much without joy, because he was very much. How could you, you couldn't have joy without the Lord. So I said, you're very, and he yelled at me. I'll never forget, he yelled at me. Friends can do that. He did. He yelled at me, and he said, I'll have you know I have more joy than anybody I know as he was yelling at me in anger. And yet, there are times when you probably have, well, this is how you do it. You pray, Father, I need to share with my friend. I'm concerned for them. I haven't seen them uh, in church, or they're not walking with you anymore. I'm concerned. You pray, you seek the Lord, and and then you have friends sometimes praying for you because you say, I have to go see a very dear friend of mine and I have to share with them. And you do. And you go and you knock on the door and they invite you in and you sit down, you begin to visit. And then at a certain point, you say to them, I just want you to know something. I want you to know I love you. And I want you to know I'm concerned for you. And this is what I'm concerned about. And you don't know how they're going to respond. You don't. Because they could, go, they could go off on you or kick you out of the house. There's a thousand and one things. And they look at you and they say, you know what? I haven't, been, I haven't been walking with the Lord the way I should. And the Holy Spirit has been convicting me. And I just want to tell you thank you. Thank you for loving me enough to tell me the truth. Thank you for caring about me. There are people who do that. There are people who will listen. And that's what he's saying here. Basically, don't correct a scoffer unless he hates you, but rebuke a wise man, he'll love you. Verse 9, give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. So wisdom can be added to, and it profits the one who is open to instruction. A just man can grow in righteousness, and this man desires to be taught. He goes on in verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, for by me your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. If you're wise, you're wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Now, the fear of the Lord is a foundation of a good life. Remember, the fool acts as if there's no God, but the wise are continually aware of the majestic power of God. And he's saying that having a healthy fear of the Lord actually increases you. It adds to your learning. Uh, it encourages you to receive correction. The fear of the Lord will, will produce a long life that is productive. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, this is the commandment. These are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. The fear of the Lord prolongs your days. It teaches you to avoid things that could cut your life short. It encourages you to, to do the things that produce peace in your life. So he says it begins there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where it begins. He says in verse 12, if you are wise, you're wise for yourself. If you scoff, you will bear it alone. That's an interesting thing. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone bear it. The consequences of our decisions and our way of life reflect chiefly on ourselves. Here's something practical to think about. In a time where we have learned
to blame everybody else for the poor things that we go through, the problems that we have, and it's pretty easy to do that. Many years ago, I heard this. Somebody said that one of the things that has influenced the United States in the most negative way over the last many years has been the intrusion of Freudian psychology, which gave to us the ability to explain away all of our bad behavior. And the psychology, uh, psychology of the nation, we have been psychologized in many ways, philosophized in many ways. It is very true. There, are, there, are, there is an entire culture today, American culture, that is very capable of blaming everybody for the condition they find themselves in. We know that, don't we? It's true. We know how to blame my mom. We know how to blame my dad. We know how to blame my educational system. We know how to blame all those people for not giving me a chance. We know how to blame every, and then what it's given itself over to is envy and jealousy and a lot of angry, anger. And that's what we have in our nation right now. And there's an awful lot of it. If you're successful, there's somebody who is upset that you're successful. If you have a new car, there's somebody who gets upset because you shouldn't have a new car. Why? Because they want that new car. And so what has happened is envy has taken over a lot of hearts. And we blame a lot of people for bad choices that we have made. So the bottom line is, if I sow to the flesh from the flesh, I do reap corruption. And ultimately, the things that I do will have consequences. And so the consequences of my own decisions uh, are going to be reflected in my way of life. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it says, Let each one examine his own work. Then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. So if you're wise, you're wise for yourself. The consequences of our decisions, our way of life, reflect chiefly on ourselves. Because in many ways, we have sown to the wind, we will reap the whirlwind. And so he's making it very clear that we have to be aware of the consequences of our choices. You see, wisdom has its own advantages, and it ultimately rewards the one who exercises it. And wisdom is satisfying and is most certainly worth pursuing. But if you reject wisdom, you will reap the consequences of a foolish life. Ultimately, we stand before the Lord, and we stand before him alone. I wonder how many of us think that when we stand before God, we're going to be able to bring all the people we can blame for our life. And the Lord says, I'm going to speak to you about your life. Just a second, let me bring my mom. You do, you don't know what my mom was like, and it's the reason I'm this way. You see, we stand before the Lord, the Lord, and we can't blame others for the choices that we make. Yes, there are others who have influenced us, and yes, we have to be very careful who we allow to influence us. There's no doubt about it. We contribute to one another's choices. But ultimately, when the choice is made, it's something that I have to own up to. People can hear the gospel, but they can reject its message. Ultimately, they will reap the consequences. In John 12, 48, Jesus said it like this, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You see, people make decisions, and very often they make a complete rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that in the New Testament once again, when that the Lord would be speaking to the religious leaders, and very often they would hear what he was saying but reject his words. You see it with the scribes. You see it with Pharisees. Luke writes about it in chapter 7, verses 29 and 30. When he says, when all the people heard him and all the people heard Jesus, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. They rejected God's word. They didn't repent, and thus they are going to end up reaping the consequences of such a choice. In verse 13, a foolish woman is clamorous. She's simple, knows nothing. For she, 
She sits at the door of her house on a seat by the highest places of the city to call to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And as for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of hell. What a cheery thing to close with, huh? <laughs> Let's look at that and find application. First, notice something. Notice how foolishness is described in contrast to wisdom. Notice that foolishness is described as clamorous. Again, that's not a word that we use generally. Clamorous speaks of something that is loud. Foolishness is described as being boisterous. She's described as someone who's making a lot of noise and gaining a lot of attention. Um, she's on a bullhorn, if you will. She's carrying a placard. She's wearing a funny costume. She's marching. She's calling out, pay attention to me, drawing attention to herself. And as she's doing that, she is looked at as being or described as being simple. She knows nothing. She's foolish. She's undisciplined. She's uncertain. But there she is seated in, in, in a prominent place in the city. She's out in the open. So this tells us that foolishness actually attempts to imitate wisdom. And we see that all the time. All you need to do is watch the news and listen to the commentators and the arguments that go on. And you'll see very often that foolishness is attempting to imitate wisdom. We're living in a day right now that that has taken place. And, and I know this can be offensive to some. Hopefully it isn't offensive to, to any of us in here right now. When this goes over the air, I'll find out who it offended. But we're living in a time that, that you almost have to voluntarily blind yourself to just not see. You know, I used to tease, I used to, in a teasing way, some of you have been with me for a while and you've heard me say something like this, where I've said, just because I say I'm something doesn't mean that that is what I am. I, uh, and I've said, you know, I, I could say to you right now that I'm a six foot five Swedish person. And that's what I am. And I've teasingly said that just to make a simple point. You can say that I'm Bjorn again, you know, anyway. And, and I have said to you, if I were to say that, that I'm a six foot five, or if I said I'm a six foot eight African American basketball player, everybody in this room would say, oh, he needs to take some time off. <laughs> he's, in, he's under stress. He's deluded. Would you say that? You would say that. Would you say that on TV? When a commentator is telling you, you have the right to choose exactly what you are just by saying it. So if you want to be a Filipino woman, even though you're a Swedish man, you can be. That is true. That is happening now. There, is, there, there are so many definitions of who you are now. You can be basically who you want to be, and nobody has the right to tell you that's not what you are. That's, that to me is unheard of, but it is being taught today from preschool into college. That's going through, that's permeating our entire educational system right now. Some of you know that. You choose what you want to be. So Bruce Jenner can be a woman and everybody says she now because he says it. And, and it reminds me of that old children's story of the emperor who with no clothes, he, he's running around naked because, you know, he thinks that he's got beautiful. And then they, they told the emperor, they said, well, you know, it looks as if you don't have any clothes on, but only the most royal can see it. And so he, he's out there, he's walking around naked. And he's parading himself naked. We all know the story of the emperor with no clothes. And then a little boy is standing out in the midst and he says, he ain't got no clothes on. And it took a child to say what the adults refused to admit. We're living in a society like that right now. Guys, I did not believe in my lifetime that I would see something like this. I just, I, I just, 
It's no complaint. It's a challenge for us to learn to communicate. But I'll tell you, it's a fact. We're living in a state that I think is a crazy, crazy state. I could go on and on about that. I won't. But it is it, it has changed in my lifetime. This state that we live in, which was the golden state, has really changed. And it's all the philosophy that's coming from our governmental system. It really is. And it's the rejection of Christ and rejection of the simple truths of Scripture. And wisdom is on the street corner crying out, you have to admit that you're naive and simple in order to partake of me. You have to admit that. And if you do, I've got a banquet that's laid out for you, and it will feed you, and you will, your life will be changed. But foolishness does the same thing. And she cries out in a clamorous way, getting attention, drawing people to herself. And that's the point that's being made right here as we look at this. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And as for him who lacks understanding, so foolishness is inviting us to partake of foolishness. Bad advice is given constantly. Receiving it and acting upon it only produces pain. That's why we need to be wise in who we allow to influence us. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, remember this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Well, foolishness is sitting at the door of her house, on a seat by the highest place of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. And the invitation again, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, stolen water is sweet, bread eaten in secret is pleasant. What an interesting, interesting phrase. Stolen water is sweet. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Stolen water. There is a certain exhilaration that is, that is experienced when you cross a boundary that you were taught never to cross. There's a certain rush that you get the first time you steal something and don't get caught. There's a certain adrenaline rush when you lie and get away with it. There's a certain high that you can have when you seduce somebody or when you enter into an improper sexual relationship or when you take another man's wife or steal another woman's husband. Stolen water is sweet. The, the, the rush, the excitement. <laughs> there have been songs that have been sung and written about these things forever. I've been on the radio since I can remember radio. And they speak about having to meet in secret places and, you know, or me and Mrs. Jones, and you can name them. I mean, there's, you know, got a thing going on. And uh, that's an oldie. That's a blast from the past. I can hear the old people's false teeth rattling in their jaws right now. <laughs> but that's, 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 we all know that, you know, that the thrill of, of connecting in that way. Stolen water is sweet. And that's what he's saying here. Foolishness leads you into something that at first appears to be pleasant but ultimately, it destroys you. When Eve was tempted by the serpent and the, the forbidden fruit was pointed out to her, it's good for so many things. It's, it'll give you wisdom and tastes good and all of the things that the serpent pointed out to Eve. The appeal was overwhelming. And the Bible tells us that she took of it and she gave it to her husband with her and he ate. There was that taking of that, but mankind, humankind fell when Adam partook of it. You can never 
You can never sin and get away with it. Please remember that always. You may think that you can, but you can't. You can't. Sometimes the Lord is very patient and he doesn't deal with you Im immediately. We know that, don't we? There have been times that, that I have done something, as a young believer especially, and the heavens didn't open and the hand of God with the fly swatter didn't come out and smash me. And I thought I, I got away with it. It wasn't that bad. It must not be wrong. Sometimes the Lord is just extremely patient with you. He gives you opportunity after opportunity to repent. He does. I've done that with my children when they were small. I, I, I would not react sometimes quick as I might have, hoping to give them a space to repent so that they'd voluntarily see it was wrong and turn. And sometimes the Lord does that to us. But ultimately, we will reap what we sow. And we may think that getting involved in that relationship with that coworker or that neighbor, that we're going to get away with it, but you never do. Those are the kinds of things you never get away with. You just think you're getting away with it. At the moment, stolen water is sweet. And at the moment, bread eaten in secret tastes good because you don't think anybody knows. It may have excitement, but the result is terrible. It's interesting how it says here in verse 18, he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of hell. Hell is, uh, in this passage here, it's a, it's a Hebrew word, it's Sheol. Sheol is translated by the word grave 31 times in the Old Testament. It is translated with the word hell 31 times, and it's also referred to as the pit three times. Sheol is the underworld. It's the Old Testament designation for the abode of the dead. It's the place of no return, and it's where the wicked are sent, and they are sent there for punishment. It is the place of eternal exile. And he says he does not know that the dead are there. Her guests are in the depths of hell, eternal exile, eternal judgment. So instead of wisdom's banquet, foolishness results in eternal judgment. Somebody said it has been said that many eat on earth what they digest in hell. That is something that we see in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus had a poor life. The rich man ate sumptuously every day. Ultimately, they both die. Lazarus ends up in what is called the bosom of Abraham, while the rich man is in the place of torment. And as this is taking place, according to Luke 16, verses 24 and 25, the rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. Cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, likewise Lazarus' evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. The rich man ate well, dressed beautifully, had banquets daily. Lazarus sat at the gate, filled with sores, and had no medicine, so the dogs would come and lick his wounds. And they both died. The warning is obvious. Pleasure on earth without God is temporary. So choose God. Choose wisdom. Choose a relationship with him and realize that you do reap the consequences through eternity. You may be deceived into thinking you're getting away with it, Solomon would be saying, but remember, there are eternal results to rejecting the wisdom that God offers through, we would, in New Testament terms, say it like this, the wisdom that is given to us in Jesus Christ through the gospel. And so, if there's anything that we seek, as we seek so many things, seek 
wisdom. 